Thank you. Thank you for a nice introduction. And actually, this is my second time that um, I will present after the best paper. So I'm <laughs> kind of nervous. But I'm OK, because I'm a student of James. I own, partially own that credit of um, that figure. OK, so um, today I'm going to talk about Dint, Fast Internal Distributed Transaction with eBPF. And this is joint work with Harvard, Peking, and also Cornell universities. Um, the background is that data center applications normally rely on distributed protocols for high availability. For example, in Hadoop and Kubernetes, you normally run this distributed consensus protocol to store some cluster configurations, states, or metadata. And on the line, the popular YouTube application is actually the spanner database that runs some distributed transaction protocol to maintain critical user states. So in previous work called um, Electra from NSDI 2023, we studied how to accelerate distributed consensus protocol, especially around its fan-in and fan-out communication patterns. And along that line, this work called Dint, we will look at how to accelerate the distributed transaction protocols, and especially on its data management. So let me quickly go, go through the background of how distributed transaction works inside a single data centers. We are focusing on within a single data center, not across a WAN. So the popular one is called an OCC, or the Optimistic Concurrent Control um, Protocol, working on a set of replicated key value store, right? And they have primary and backups. And the transaction client will first try to read and lock, do some read lock operations to um, read the versions and values of uh, reset keys, and then lock the write set keys. And therefore, um, two, key two key components in the transaction server is you need to have a lock manager and also a key value store. And, and then after this read and write, the client will update the write set value locally and then validate the reset versions again. Once confirming all the reset version has not been changed since last read, you can, um, the, the, the client can begin to log these write set updates, right? And therefore, another key component you see is actually the log manager. That's the three key components in these transaction servers. And finally, the client will do the commit. Uh, they will uh, commit and apply the write set updates to the primary and backups and finishing the transaction. So I want to also want mention a recent trend of this distributed protocol is that they try to store the states in local memory or local persistent memory for fast accesses. So in this, uh, in this talk, we more mainly focus on this in-memory transaction scenarios. But overall, for these cases, you will see the distributed transactions are generally network I.O. intensive, as they tend to work on in-memory data nowadays. And by nature, they communicate frequently among different replicas, right? So, this I.O. intensiveness will incur some problems. And the first, um, the, the most important problem is when you implement them using the widely used kernel networking stacks, it cannot incur really high kernel overhead. Let me explain using this simple um, OS API for sending data over networks. And it has many layers. Let me show its flame graph using basically the function calling stack in the one direction and CPU time on different directions you will see why spend a lot of time on the kernel. The first, it goes through the syscall layer, doing some user kernel contact switching. Um, next, it will go to a socket layer, then IP layer, which actually spend a bunch of time on packet buffer allocations. Then it will go to a device layer. Finally, um, it will go to the driver function to really send the data. But overall, you see around 90% of CPU time is actually spent on the uh, various kernel layers. And to be more specific, based on our measurement, we implement a simple OCC distributed transaction protocol. It will spend around 90% of CPU time on various socket functions, such as the send to or receive from uh, functions. And among these CPU times, only around one tenth of them is spent on the NIC driver function that really send or receive um, um, messages. So this high kernel overhead will squeeze the CPU time that application operations can use. Therefore, severely degrading application performance. Right? So how can we do with this problem? Well, people already think of kernel bypass. Um, does it solve all the problems? Unfortunately, the answer is no. For example, the representative technique is DBDK or RDMA uh, that moves customized networking stacks from kernel to the user space or even to the NIC hardware like in RDMA. And this will give you high performance indeed. But it also requires 
dedicated resources such as busy polling calls, uh, which is bad if you have low load cases, and undesired in public cloud where you, you want every call you run just for application work. It may also bring some security vulnerabilities, but the high level point is now the user can directly manage the NIC hardware without kernel access controls or firewalls. And overall, um, there's a strong tension between high performance and also resource sharing and security. And both popular kernel bypass and kernel networking can hardly achieve both. And so how can we do with this tension? Maybe kind of achieve the best of both worlds. And that's the focus of this work. OK, so our key idea is kind of like the opposite side of kernel bypass. And we do something called a user bypass. And technically, we call it application customized networking stacks. What we did is we tried to offload some distributed protocol logic into a lower layer of the kernel networking stacks. And this logic could intersect protocol um, requests coming into the kernel networking stacks, update the application states in the kernel memory, and then send back protocol responses. And the benefit of doing so is that it can get rid of most of the kernel overhead, for example, the contact switching and some unnecessary stack layer traversings. In addition, we can rely on or leverage the packet batching, which is already done in like Linux and API, to amortize this interrupt overhead. So therefore, it will give us high performance and good resource sharing as we are purely interrupt driven. It is also more secure than kernel bypass, as in now the privileged kernel, they directly manage the NIC hardware um, so they, they can set proper firewall rules or access control rules. That's a hollow idea. However, we have missed an important problem. What if the application logic is malicious? They might just crash the whole kernel and impact every services, every applications on that um, server, right? And therefore, the problem is how do we guarantee, how could we guarantee the kernel safety? and especially in facing malicious application logic. And to, to tackle that problem, our um, high-level idea is to leverage the recent eBPF language, which is verified to be safe, uh, to safely run program in the kernel at program. And the good thing is it guarantees kernel safety through static verification, and that's exactly what we want. So more background in BPF, it was originally designed for packet filtering and monitoring. For example, in the Linux kernel networking stacks, you can have the TC and XDB hooks where you can run eBPF program there. And more specifically, we will write our distributed protocol logic into some eBPF programs and offload to these hooks and let these programs to process, process protocol requests and forward, modify and forward them back as responses. That's our high-level approach, how to use this eBPF. Moreover, the eBPF can maintain some um, application states using some kernel built-in eBPF map data structures, such as array and queues. So therefore, they can, arbitrarily, they can, they can implement a lot of kinds of different applications, operations, and their states. However, eBPF indeed has its dirty side. That's exactly because of its static verification nature, where um, it has really constrained programming model. For example, um, it only allows limited number of instructions, bounded loops, um, and only static memory allocations, basically no malloc in the eBPF program. In contrast, these real protocols can be really complex. Um, so here I'm going to use uh, the, 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 this figure for a third time, for a fourth time. Um, and, um, it may look like this crazy hand-drawing figure from my advisor, James. And he's really proud of this figure, by the way. And basically, some rare cases are too complex to run in the constrained eBPF. For example, you may have some failure handling or massive handling, massive loss, or you may need to run some malloc. You, you may need malloc function to maintain some complex data uh, in, your, in your protocol, like in transaction or data store. We need to cope this. Uh, we need to, how can we cope with such complexity in the constrained eBPF? That's our problems. But as you can see, our key insight is let's focus on and offload the common cases to the eBPF, while, uh, which tend to be simple and dominate the performance at their common cases, while let's leave these real cases to the user space. And that, that's, our high, that's our high level philosophy of handling, um, of tackling this challenge. OK, so the resulting system is called Dint. But before 
um, dive into DIM design, let me show you how DIM works in, from a high level, how they enforce this rare and, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, common cases. The transaction client will send a request to the transaction uh, servers. It will go through a request parser. Um, then the request parser will pass them to either um, three of these key components. And in common cases, this request will be directly forwarded back with, uh, with modified data as responses. And in rare cases, some key value requests cannot be served by the kernel eBPF components. We will forward them back, forward them to the user space to handle. And the user space will uh, receive these requests and also send back the responses through the UDP sockets. And these requests will also, these responses from the rare cases will also go through a kernel space bookkeeping eBPF program to maintain some internal states, such as releasing some internal logs. Now, let me go through each of these three um, key components quickly. The first is offloading the log manager. Um, what we did is we maintain a shared eBPF array inside the kernel space to store an array of log states. And uh, each state may contain some spin log bits or some counters depending on, depending on the type of logs you're gonna use. And uh, then when receiving uh, a log request, the eBPF program will hash a log ID into a log state, then run some compare and swap operations um, uh, to acquire the log. Right. And so here eBPF supports all kinds of atomics you see in the user space and it's as efficiently as you use in user space. It's a pretty uh, great um, ecosystem. And assume this log has been acquired now. The problem is um, what if another transaction client, they, they try to hash a different log ID to the same log state, right? And ideally, we, we should maintain some weak queue uh, for the client that cannot immediately acquire the log, right? However, this is hard for eBPF with no malloc support. And therefore, we try to uh, directly return failure for such locking request and let the client, client, client transaction client retry the locking. And this normally happens in the rare cases of hash collision, therefore not impacting much of the performance. And the next is about offloading the key value store with get and put operations. Uh, here the common case is there are many, many small key values in typical workloads. Um, for example, dozens of bytes uh, to store some counter or ID like data. Therefore, we could use a static allocated eBPF map in the, in the kernel to store some small key value pairs and the cache in the kernel to, so that you can avoid malloc in the eBPF like this. And each key will be mapped to a bucket which can stores a fixed number of uh, small key value pairs. And for large key value pairs, we'll just build them to the user space in a malloc memory so that we can still handle all the key value lookups and uh, put get operations. Now, with this data layout, um, can we achieve fast get and put? There are indeed a few challenges, but um, here I'm going to kind of talk about one challenge of how to achieve fast get, especially for non-existing keys. So for existing key, you can see we maintain a cache in the kernel, so it's fast uh, sub there. But for non-existing keys, it, we always need to check the user space to see if the key exists or not, right? And we need to do something to avoid that. So our approach is we, we're going to embed a small balloon filter inside each kernel bucket to record these overflow keys. So the nice thing about balloon filter is it can quickly tell you whether the key is inside a set in an approximate manner that is really um, efficient, memory efficient, and really easy to implement in eBPF. So we use this balloon filter to remove these unnecessary user space checks for these non-existing key lookups. They're just directly answering not found, and then they can respond back. OK, um, there's also another tricky part here is what if some workloads delete overflow keys? While balloon filter is known to not support deletion, uh, we need to some, do something to handle that. So, um, our high-level intuition is here, we try to let user space handle that job. We, we try to let user space reconstruct that Bloom filter and then update in the kernel uh, through the previous mentioned eBPF bookkeeping program in the real cases. That's how we achieve um, uh, fast put, oh, sorry, fast get. And our paper have many other challenges and designs to achieve, for example, fast put, fast locking, and especially the tricky user kernel synchronizations. And, but here, due to inter, inter, in, in the interest of time, I will leave them offline. Okay, so the final, uh, the, the last component is the log manager. Uh, it's very simple. We maintain a set of per-call eBPF dream buffer in the kernel space. 
uh, so that um, they just log their entry uh, to this Lorene buffer. And then when the user space needs to do some failure recovery, they will just replay these logs. And this ring buffer can avoid some um, cross-call communication or synchronization overhead that's been really, really efficient. Yeah. Um, one last point about this, um, we also did a lot of system optimizations. For example, uh, we tried to uh, separate the interrupt handling calls and the real case handling calls so that to avoid some user kernel contact switching overhead. As like here, we, that, we, we devote one set of calls to handle, uh, handle interrupt and run the eBPI program, while another set of calls to handle rare cases, so that any call just only stayed in the kernel or only stayed in the user space without doing user kernel contact switching. And this can increase the performance by 2.4x in the extreme um, IO intensive workload. Okay, to move into the implementation and the evaluation, we implement with 2K line of eBPF and 4K line of uh, C++ for two different types of distributed transaction protocols. And uh, we use 3V primary, back, uh, primary backup replication and 3V sharding. And we use CloudLab uh, bare metal machine to do experiment on TATP workload. And this talk will mainly focus on the OCC. Um, our code is also open sourced. Feel free to try on. Um, let me quickly go through the results. This result is the main result comparing the tail latency versus throughput curves. That's a pretty standard in, uh, in some transaction processing um, benchmarks. Uh, we will change the, uh, change the number of client, we change the number of throughput pro uh, it, it, it gave to the um, transaction servers that measure the tail latency. And you can see it performs far better than the Linux kernel networking stacks. And its number actually grew into 22x, another more uh, intensive workloads. Uh, we also compared to a kernel bypass baseline called Caledon. We actually, we were surprised for we perform even better than Caledon. And the reason is because we can avoid the extra packet copies happen, happens in these uh, Caledon's socket API uh, interfaces. And that's a perform number we, we, we get uh, over Caledon with slightly higher tail latency because of interrupt processing. And finally, we look at the CPU utilization versus throughput. We can provide, we, because we rely on interrupt, we can provide pretty good um, CPU scaling based on the workload, um, like based on the load of the workload. For example, as we increase the throughput, you will see the dint actually use, uh, slower, use lower, uh, like fewer number of calls when the throughput is high. And when the throughput is lower, it slightly use higher call than this Caledon workload. So than, than the Caledon baseline. And um, we believe with some future um, interrupt call co consolidation would help on these low load cases. And finally, uh, we enable application customized kernel networking stacks with eBP offloads for common cases, while user space for rare cases. And here we cover distributed transaction protocols, but um, it could be generalizable to many other uh, distributed protocols, especially its key, three key, key, key building blocks. And finally, I'm happy to take any questions 